Three of the hardest things to say is, I'm sorry, I need help, and algorithmification. <laughs> so bear with me, as I said, I'm, I'm originally German. I'm allowed to invent these long words that nobody knows how to pronounce. And I've been using, I've been using this term for quite a bit now, for several years, and it, it turned out to be useful. So please bear with me and my little quirks here. And you know, academics, we invent these words. And, uh, and uh, as Stanislav Ulam once said, uh, one academic would rather use the toothbrush of another academic than adopting the nomenclature. So each one of us has their little uh, terms and, and terminologies, but you know, I've been using it now for, for the better part of the decade and it became extremely useful, especially in the paradigm of artificial intelligence. It helps you to understand a little bit what's going on and that's what we're doing today. We're talking about the building blocks. So let's see what algorithmification is about. Algorithmification does to knowledge what digitalization is doing to information and communication, basically to data. So let's look at digitalization first. So be first of all aware that there's a difference between digitization and digitalization. And I'm, I'm using these words with a specific purpose. Digitization is you basically take information, data that's in analog format, and you convert it into a digital version. You digitize it. So I, I was a few years ago a visiting a scholar at the Library of Congress, and in the Library of Congress, they're doing that a lot. So in, in libraries, they take books, analog books, the world's information that is stored in these books, and they digitize it. They basically make copies, and that is great because once it's in digital format, we will talk about the characteristics of digital content in a, in a later lecture. It has a lot of benefits. You can send it around the world in digital networks. You can copy paste it. You can search it. You can, you know, we can do many things with it. So that's fantastic that we save that. But that's what's happening. So there is basically a replication of this kind of information. Now that's different to digitalization. What this gentleman here did in his little garage, <laughs> where he wrote on the on the wall Amazon.com, as Jeff Bezos in 1994, uh, he digitalized the book market. Amazon at the beginning was a retailer, a sales platform for books, exclusively for books. So it basically did something that's similar to what the Library of, Cong Library of Congress is renting out books. And Jeff Bezos sold books. Now, he started that in 1994, and only five years later, he was already the person of the year because he actually transformed the entire industry. So while digitization is the replication, you really take the book, you convert into digital format, you don't change anything, you replicate what is, what is digitalization is the transformation. So it has to do with the form. The form is changing. It's a qualitative change in form that's going on. And you know something similar happens with algorithmification and its opposite, algorithmization. So in algorithmization, I basically take a process, process that a recipe that involves knowledge, and I algorithmize, algorithmize it. Now it's difficult for me to pronounce these things. <laughs> so I algorithmize it. Uh, that is different to when I algorithmify it. The fication comes from facere in Latin, also in Portuguese. Que vai facer? No, uh, facer is to make, to do. So you trans. Form it. So that has to do that. You do that with knowledge process, with algorithms. So let's let's have a look at first of all what algorithms are. So what are algorithms? Open the computer science textbook and let's just read it. An algorithm is an ordered set of unambiguous executable steps that defines a terminating process. This last part is you know because some algorithms never stop; they have to halt at one point. So it has to, it has to compute something. Um, but, but, but the majority of the most important part is that an algorithm is an ordered set of unambiguous and executable steps. Now, there's another word you can use, and for all practical purposes, every time you hear the word algorithm, you can replace it with this word, with the word recipe. And if you don't take anything else away from this entire specialization, then 
then I will be very sad because I hope you take a lot of things away from all of this talking that I'm doing. But if you don't take anything away, replace algorithm with recipe and it tells you a lot about what's going on. A recipe basically. So here I have a recipe of how to bake a cake. It's a terminating process. I compute something or I bake something. I bake a cake. And it's an ordered set of unambiguous executable steps. So you start with this amount of flour, with this amount of sugar, with this amount of teaspoons of baking powder, and then you mix it. And if you have, if you want to make more cake, then you take tw if, then, if, then, if, then. If you want to make it a, a little bit more baked, then you keep it in a little bit longer. So there are different subroutines that you can change, different if, then, if, then coding clauses, but that basically you know, tells you what an algorithm is. It's a recipe. And, you know, the world is full of recipes. If you do some art project, you follow a recipe. When you learn an instrument or you learn a sport, you basically, you know, your coach or your teacher teaches you recipe. When you have a job, when you do an apprenticeship, here, you know, in taking these kind of courses, you learn cognitive recipes of how to think about things. When you have a job, a physical job, uh, ways of doing things. So the algorithm tells you the way of doing things. Now, if they become very important, then we put them, we make them more socially collective. For example, culture is a collection of ways of doing things. If you go to one country, you might give some, like for example, if you go to Paris, you man and a woman give themselves a kiss on a cheek, on one cheek. If you go to South America, in Chile, you give a kiss on both cheeks. Here in the United States, if you do that, you will go prison. <laughs> so like, whoa, you don't, you just give the hand. If you even give the hand, if not, you give a fist bump, you know? So there's different algorithms you live by when you're in different cultures. And you know that if you are in Paris, then, you know, as the Romans do. In an extreme case, these laws that, that we live by, if somebody doesn't comply with them, we take him out of society and put him in prison. Because this society runs on a, on a big algorithms that we all agree on. That's what we should do. So you kind of like have to apply, if they're really important, these algorithms have to apply by these laws. And that's how we organize our society. There is a kind of code that's a super code, for example, the constitution that organizes how also other other algorithms run, but it's kind of it's algorithms all the way all the way up and all and all the way down. So so like once you put on these glasses of, of of algorithms, you see algorithms everywhere. And just the recipes that we behave, a lot of behavior is algorithmic. Uh, it's an ordered step. Now, not all of these processes are really explicit. Sometimes you don't really, even so they give you the algorithm, you don't really know what to do, right? Then, then you come to the part in the IKEA closet where it says, hey, call us. You, you cannot really follow the algorithm, how to screw that together, right? So uh, then he's like, well, that is not, the, the, the explicit description doesn't allow me to do that. And that's a very important distinction. Not everything that we do is explicit. By the way, not everything that machines do is explicit. Some of these modern neural networks, the transformer networks, we have no idea actually what they're doing in the way how they're doing it. And that's a very important distinction. So you have algorithms or knowledge that are tacit, implicit, or that can be explicit. That goes back to the 1950s, 1950, 50, uh, 58, I think it was for the first time published, Polanyi, personal knowledge. And, and these things become important. That's what I want to talk about in the knowledge age. So a tacit, recipe is basically when you do something but you don't really know what you're doing you're still doing it it's uh, the master that teaches the karate kid how to fight karate now the master cannot really teach it the master just say well you, you follow doing this movement you follow doing this movement and then at the end when the kid has learned from the master of what to do the kid just follow the karate kid just follows this routine very quickly without really knowing what exactly it is doing now, if you would have the explicit algorithm of what you're doing when you're fighting karate, then you could download it. That's what we do in the matrix. So, so if in the matrix, when you learn how to do karate, right, just download the code of karate, and then suddenly, you know, you have a step-by-step -step recipe of fighting, of fighting karate. So what we often do with algorithms, the algorithm algorithmization game is we have some kind of processes we don't know what's going on but we try to figure out step to step what it is in order to convert it into algorithmic form then we can code it up we can write it up 
Now, some modern neural nets, transformer networks, they do something, we don't really know what it is. And here the challenge is we have to see like, oh, what are you doing actually? Your algorithm, right? We have to figure out the step-by-step, step-by-step recipe of what it's doing. And that goes back, this distinction, especially how it relates to artificial intelligence, goes all the way back to the founding years of, of our field. Uh, once in a, in a conference, they asked Professor John van Neumann, one of the founding founders of, of modern computer science, they asked Professor John van Neumann, a machine cannot think, or can it? And Professor Neumann responded, well, once you tell me exactly what it is a machine cannot do, I can build a machine that can exactly do what you described, step by step. So when you tell me what it is, what thinking is, then I can build a machine that can do exactly that because once you described it, I can, I can code it up. Then it became explicit. And so while not all algorithms are necessarily explicit, they are also tacit. We want, if once we want to study them and understand what we're doing, uh, it's useful to make them explicit. And the same Professor John von Neumann, therefore, used the technique in order to present what algorithms do. And that goes back here to the, that's 1948. Here he is, uh, John von Neumann. And he, he came up with these flowcharts. So often when we represent algorithms, we represent them in these flowcharts. These are some of the original ones that he came up with in the 1940s. And it explains a process. So you're here in the process and then you can, if that happens, then you go down here. If not, then you go down here and you go, you rattle through this flowchart and you execute a process. Step by step, you execute the recipe. The technical term for these kind of flowcharts is a state machine. So in theoretical computer science, you have these state machines that then you can use them to describe algorithms, to describe processes. For example, here I have a machine. These are these machines you find in the metro station and the machine is locked. And then if you put in a coin, it gets unlocked. Now, if you put in another coin, it stays unlocked. It goes around here in the circle. But then if you push, it becomes locked again. Now, then if you push it still, it still, it still stays locked. However, if you put in a coin, then it gets... So this state machine, this flowchart basically describes a process. So we use these, you know, figurative with, with, the, with the arrows and so forth. We just use them to describe what algorithms do. They do recipe, they are recipes. And then once we're in one state, we can go to another state and then something else happens. In automata theory, in theoretical computer science, that goes all the way up. One of the most generalizable and, and very important of these, of these theoretical frameworks are Turing machines. Alan Turing, another one of the founders of, of modern day computer science, they call him actually often the founder of computer science, uh, mathematician, logician, very important. Also a victim of prejudice. The government of Britain not too long ago officially apologized for, for the persecution uh, of, of Turing as a homosexual at the end. He likely committed suicide. He was a very tragic figure as well. But genius and brilliant of explaining to us what computation actually is and what algorithms are. And he came up with this framework Today we talk about building blocks with this framework of what computation is. And you have at the heart of it, this state machine. You see this flow chart here, that's the, that's the algorithm. Uh, besides that, you have communication and storage. So communication is the, tr uh, the, the, the transmission of information through space. And storage is the transmission of information through time. So that's just, you know, the two fundamental aspects of reality, space and time. And then, Importantly, what the state machine does with communication and storage, it tells you what to do. So I invite you to please watch this little video here uh, to learn more about what a Turing machine is and what it does. And these state machines, these flowcharts are extremely useful not only to describe uh, digital algorithms, but all kinds of algorithms. I worked quite a bit in mining companies in recent years and learned a lot about how these companies work. It's really fascinating. It's fascinating how organizations that actually go all the way back to the Stone Age organize their processes and, and, and how these algorithms work. And now we try to algorithmize and then algorithmify these kind of processes. And it's useful to make them explicit as a first step. So from the tacit, bring it to the explicit what's going on in this company. So if you join a company, you are also given some kind of manuals, they call standard operating procedures of how you should behave when you're part of this company. Same as you behave 
you say hello differently when you're in Paris or when you're in Santiago de Chile or, or when you're here in California, you also behave differently in different companies. So here what we did is we just took one of these standard operating procedures from, from a company and this describes how you are supposed to behave, the recipe of behavior when you receive a donation request. Well, it says when you receive a donation request, well, first forward it to the corporate responsibility office and then check. If it is expecting some kind of favor in return, then do not accept. And if then, sub-algorithm clause. Now, if it doesn't accept, then, well, if it exceeds a certain amount, then do not accept. Otherwise, if then else, then keep on going, right? So it explains you, it, it tells you how to compute the decision of if to accept the donation or not to accept a donation. And social behavior is full of that, your, your day as well. Here I have another example of, of uh, Sheldon Cooper, a sitcom character of a, of a scientist who developed the friendship algorithm. So for the rest of the nerds of us, if we don't know how to make friends, you make Sheldon, Sheldon wrote it out. He made a tacit recipe explicit. You ask him, would you like to share a meal? Well, what's the response? Yes, then dine together. If no, then do you enjoy a hot beverage? Yes. No, if then else, if then else, and you can rattle through, I invite you to watch this little, little clip to see what it does. So life is full of recipes and, and, and algorithms. Now, if these algorithms and recipe are really important, then we convert them into law, say I already mentioned. And we, call, we actually talk about the code of law. You know, you code it up, you write some code. Well, you write the code of law. A code of law is a systematic collection of statutes. And that goes back to, well, it's 2000 BC. So that's 4, 000, over 4,000 years ago, where we already coded. Uh, what we coded was not digital code, what we coded was the code of law. And that is the code which is really important we're supposed to live by. If in this society that has these certain laws, you don't apply to these algorithms, they will take you out and put you in prison until you then come back because that's how we compute. It would be disturbing if you don't comply. You know, you disturb our collective computation in here. So that's why we write up this code of law. And you can look at it, this code of law. I mean, one of the most important codes of law that you can never escape is taxes. As they say, only two things are certain in life, that's death and taxes. So that's a very important, one of the oldest laws. What we did here is we took a tax code and it was still pretty simple from the 1930s. What this describes here in this English language is how when you pay taxes, you declare a dependent. A dependent is kind of like if you have a child or an elderly you take care of and you're kind of like part of your tax declaration. And then you, uh, you go by an algorithm. If the person is under 18 years old, then da -da -da. if then else, if then else, and you compute at the end if this person is a dependent by the code of law or not. Now, in the 1990s, in 1999, Professor Lawrence Lessing wrote a very interesting book that he called Code is Law. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Code is Law and the Code of Law is Code. Yeah, absolutely, Code is Law. In this very important book, what we do there is we basically algorithmatize these kind of processes. And you can think about it. So here I have the tax process of declaring a dependent. What we did then is we looked at some tax software it's TurboTax and Tax Act, and we looked at all of them, and, and we looked basically, how does the software basically implement the same process? And the process is actually quite similar. It's a, it's a little different, and you can then see how, when you algorithmatize analog processes, how they change once they're in digital format. And so going back to our framework, that's what algorithmization is about. You are not supposed to innovate with a tax code. Don't. <laughs> that is what it is. It's the law. It's the code of law. And what you do is you take the code of law and put it into digital code one by one. You're not supposed to really change that in essence, right? You have to implement the law. You can change the law, but then you have to go to the lawmakers and so forth, and then you, but not when you algorithmatize it. That's you, you stick to what it basically says and you automate the process to a certain extent. A tech so software does a lot of your work nowadays. It does a lot of your work. And we are working on actually automating it even more to make it simpler and simpler every year. And that's we basically make this, you know, some of these tacit processes explicit. 
So what that is, is the replication. That's the replication of a process very similar to what my colleagues do at the Library of Congress. And I'm very fascinated. I hang out there a lot. And it's like, wow, you're really digitizing. So they take the information, ancient information, they're digitizing it and bringing it into digital format. That's fantastic. Now, that's very different of what Jeff Bezos did with Amazon. That's digitalization, not digitization, digitalization. That's the transformation. He really transformed the industry, the book business industry. It, it became different. There are a lot of innovation that he introduced. And in a later lecture, we will talk about these characteristics, the death of distance, the, the, the rating, for example, the personalization that comes with the bus, the, the, what he puts into it. So he can do the communication can be a much more one-to-one -one communication once he has all this data. So that, that really revolutionized the, the way books are sold. And then he, he quickly went from books to all the other consumer products and took over the entire retailing world because of these innovation, the digitalization innovation that he brought in in the last, well, over 20, 25 years it took to, to, to do that and to innovate and become one of the most successful companies that we had in recent decades and of the digital age. Now, algorithmification, so that algorithmification comes from the facere, that's the to make, to do. And that it also has some qualitative changes. So we have some qualitative changes in the way of how we execute these algorithms. And we do that, for example, with machine learning, with simulations, digital twins. I mentioned several times digital twins already in this lecture. With decentralization, there are proposals of the blockchain, how the blockchain can help us to algorithmify processes and, and, and create new applications. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are probably one of the most central ways of how we algorithmify processes, innovate, make them differently. And in the next presentation, we will have to talk more about that, about artificial intelligence. But before that, before we go to the next presentation, let's just, let's just wrap up this digitalization and algorithmification. And maybe by now you can already say it, algorithmification. So we have basically a two by two matrix where we have replication and transformation, and then we have data and communication, and we have knowledge. So digitization is the replication, the fiel, trustworthy, same replication of the same information we had before. You digitize a book. Digitalization is the transformation of it. You bring in some digital characteristics, and in a later lecture, we will study these different characteristics that make the digital paradigm different. And, and you know, some of them, I mean, we're talking here on a video recording, you know, like, yeah, we are transforming space and time, thanks to characteristics that digitalization uh, it affords you. So once it's digitized, you can digitalize the processes and innovate on them. And so the same happens now. Now we go from the data and communication age to the knowledge age. The same happens now to knowledge. You can algorithmize some process, you take tax law and you convert it, or you can algorithmify the process that has to do with innovations. And that's what we talk about next when we talk about artificial intelligence.